We're just going to wait a few more minutes while people log in and then we'll get started in a minute. Okay, so I think there probably will be some more people joining as we start, um, but we only have an hour. We have a lot of guests who have a lot to say, so I'd love to get started now with everyone who's here. Um, so I'd like to welcome um, all my panelists just to turn their cameras on. Give us a wave. Um, so, oh. <laughs> I, sorry, it I, says the host stopped my camera. so I can't Oh, sorry. <laughs> The shame. That was not, wow. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, right. Not sure how I've managed to do that. Um, Camilla, do you mind just um, saying hello to everyone while I work out how to turn Helen's camera on so she can wave us? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this Friday afternoon. We're really excited to be here. I'm Camilla. You've already met Rachel. We're Invisible Women. We're based in Edinburgh and in Berlin. We are a feminist film collective and our aim is, is to reinsert forgotten filmmakers into, into the history of film. And we do that through a bunch of different things. Um, we host screenings, we do things like this. Uh, so we raise awareness and we share and we talk to lovely people um, like our three panelists today um, that you can now all three of them. See. <laughs> um, yeah, well, we're, like I said, we're super excited to be here. Um, we're really excited to get a chance to talk to our three brilliant um, panelists. So um, welcome pa Pamela Hutchinson, Simran Hans and Helen O'Hara. Um, yeah, we, it's great to have you here. And it's quite incidentally, we learned from Pamela's opening lecture on Wednesday that um, Nora Ephron's <laughs> idea of hell was sitting on a on a panel about women in film. So, welcome to our panel <laughs> on women in film. We hope this is not your idea of hell. Um, <laughs> I think it was a different kind of panel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so just to kind of like get the ball rolling to get us started, uh, we'd love for you guys to introduce yourselves for for anyone who who might not be familiar with with yourselves and your work. Um, so yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. And um, Simran, do you wanna do you wanna kick us off? Sure. Um, hi, my name's Simran. I'm a film critic, for the Observer, and a sort of freelance culture writer. Um, I used to co-program the Bechdel Test First, which is a, another feminist film collective. And I moved to London in in 2014. I did a master's in film studies, and around that time, I um started to go to a lot of repertory screenings and um, really kind of get to know London through its kind of cinema scene and so I guess that's not where my interest in the women in film started but I think that's where it began to really be nurtured um, and so yeah that's that's kind of my trajectory um, so yeah I mostly write about film but I would also write about other kind of cultural stuff and I think my interest in cinema comes from a slightly not so purely cinephilic point of view um and so we can talk about this a bit more later but i think that's perhaps why um i felt so excited to be able to talk about film um and kind of the stories that don't get 
told or the people that don't get talked about because you know my experience the the canon all of film history um you know the auteur all of these things are I felt were so kind of off-putting to me um and that's somebody who's been through formal film education so yeah hi <laughs> that's fantastic and I can't wait to dig into all that absolutely and um, Pam do you mind going next yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, my name is Pamela and I'm a freelance film critic and film historian. So write about film. Um, my particular passion, rather perversely, is the silent era. And it's quite interesting listening to what Simran's saying because these stories are sort of very different and very similar. I was sort of a sort of teenage young student film fan and I realised that a lot of the films that I was being encouraged to watch by magazines, etc., were just they were of no interest to me in the many ways. They were not not great for 17 year old women, I thought maybe. Uh, so that's when you start looking off the beaten track and I, I just found myself quite fascinated by the silent era. I did my master's in film uh, history about 20 years ago. And I remember, you know, reading about some of these great women in the silent era and it was really hard to see their films. I've been sort of writing about silent film for 10 years now, sort of when it did something else and um, now you can suddenly see a lot of these films so the sort of passion for what led me accidentally into silent films sort of been reignited again and again and now you can go on youtube and <laughs> watch these films that i thought i would never be able to watch let alone uh, in much better condition so i am super fired up about women in, in film from the 1890s onwards <laughs> Can't wait to meet some of those women later, hopefully, in this conversation. Um, and Helen, would you mind just rounding us off there? Yeah, so I'm Helen O'Hara. I'm a film journalist and writer and, um, like the other two, also freelance. I'm editor-at-large for Empire, which is kind of a minister of art portfolio. So I'm connected to the magazine, um, but not really. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> it's great. Um, and I'm co-host of the Empire podcast as well, which is why I think they like keeping me sort of around. Unlike the other two, I have no relevant education whatsoever. I, I uh, studied law and then came into film. And I did come in, I, I got very lucky. I got an internship with Empire. I worked there for 11 years before going freelance and have been, as I say, connected with the magazine ever since. So I have been in that mainstream, very male, very blockbustery world uh, practically my whole time in film and yet I still have been kind of having these discussions and conversations and and even in that context sort of going but are we sure really that these are the ones that matter and are we sure we don't want to mention those allegations and are we sure that we don't want to talk about this film as well you know and so that's been building and building in recent years and I've you know, there have been more people around to have those conversations with, including these two other women. Um, but it, it, you know, it, it was a very male dominated world that I have kind of come up through. So I'm still sort of, I feel almost like I'm still finding my feet with a lot of this stuff. Yeah, and that's another really rich topic, I think, talking about the critical ecosystem, I think, is a crucial part about talking about film history. So I think we'll definitely um, get into that later. So. For this talk, we have an hour, so just under an hour now. And I sent around a list of crazy, a crazy long list of talking points. So we're gonna get deep quite quickly because I'm just so interested to hear what you guys have to say. And um, for everyone watching, if you'd like to ask a question, we'll have the chat going the whole way through and we'll dip in to the chat as we go. So please do put in any um, thoughts, observations, questions in there, and we'll draw anything out that is really relevant. And also we'll try and reply if you've got a quick kind of, what was that name kind of question as well as we go along. Um, so yeah, hopefully um, you'll be able to get involved as well. So first question, um, just to get us started, that I wanted to ask, and you've all three of you really brilliantly actually already in your introductions kind of touched upon this already. Um, but the reason why we particularly wanted to get you three together, other than the fact that we re read your writing all the time, is that we think that you're three critics who are constantly engaging in very different ways with revisionist histories all the time in what you do. Um, so Helena, with you, that's really obvious that you've written a whole book about women versus Hollywood. So that's a, a complete, yeah, there is. <laughs> so that's a, a complete work of revisionist history there. Um, Pamela, as you mentioned, you're always picking up on women in the silent era and what you do. Um, and Simran, you do this in lots of ways, but also one of the things that really interested me was your 2020 podcast, which is itself a work of recent revisionist history um, that really made me feel differently about the early noughties. It was quite exciting, quite an exciting way. 
I so, didn't even mention that I do that. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised I didn't even come up. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's super interesting. So what I want to ask is, how do you feel when you're writing day to day, you are engaging with history? Would you agree with that idea that you are constantly writing your own revisionist histories? And what is your relationship with those histories? So you mentioned a bit the canon and kind of feeling ambivalence towards it, that kind of thing. So just a general question about how you feel you're engaging with film history all the time and what you do, I think would be really interesting. Um, Pal, I might go to you first, because I think you're the most obvious person being a film historian here. Mm, yeah, so, I mean, I'm a film historian who spent quite a long time working as a newspaper journalist. So I've sort of got that kind of hacky way about me. And I know that if you want to write, you know, the surprising fact that there were these women working in the early film industry, it's quite easy to sort of say first and only and what a pioneer and, and who knew that this could happen. And that's really good for getting people's attention, but it's a really terrible, toxic story to keep telling. You have to remind people that lots of women were doing this work, that not only certain jobs count as exciting, um, you, you can't just, every time you talk about Dorothy Osner, say, you'll never guess. So it's about sort of keeping it on the back burner a little bit, you know, always talking about the contribution of actresses or editors or producers, whatever you're, whenever you're talking about anything. And I do, when it comes to sort of day-to-day -day work, I have a thing where if, if I, I get offered a commission, I'm much more likely to take it if I know that in writing that piece, I can talk about women's work, creative work, and I can cite women um, journalists, experts, historians. You know, I just had one this morning and, you know, I thought about it for five minutes and I thought it was an interesting idea. And then I realized, aha, this is, you know, and I sort of had a list of particular experts and lots of Andrea Arnold films. And I was like, great, definitely going to do this um and you know I'd hate it if someone else did it and they ignored yeah. that part of the topic <laughs> so I sort of want to constantly remind people that there's a lot going on I remember me writing a piece for the Guardian and I mentioned in passing that there were lots of women working in film in the silent era and I had a comment because you know it's always good to read the comments and said oh I'm not sure if that's true Pamela because I can only think of Dorothy Arsner and I thought oh you can only think of her oh that's great so the next week I wrote a long article about how there were many and you sort of have to keep realizing that people are still surprised it can seem like you're just telling people about the same people again and again but they, you sort of have to plug away a bit annoyingly I think that's something that is really that we definitely come up across all the time which is that um feeling of not wanting to tell the same story over and over again of like isn't it great that a woman made a film and it was great and Lois Weber was the biggest uh, highest paid director in Hollywood for a while and you know there's kind of extreme stories um because that tends to stop you from actually digging into the quality of what they're making and mm. that's that's not useful and that doesn't mean that they're being assessed on the same critical level as their male peers so it's also not helpful um but the other thing is the idea that you have to keep retelling these histories because mm. I think when you move in like a feminist film echo chamber, which I feel I probably do, you start to think that it's really obvious, but actually there are so many ways in which these histories have been erased and remain erased and repressed and ignored in large parts of film culture and popular culture that you do need to keep retelling them over and over again. And sometimes in quite a casual way. Yeah, it can't always be, wow, Alice Guy. Though, you know, yeah. people do seem to forget every 10 years that Alice Guy invented narrative filmmaking on her lunch break. I'm slightly exaggerating when I say that bit always makes me smile. Only slightly. <laughs> but I think um, it's interesting, Pam, that you say like every 10 years you get reminded of something because I do think that these things go in cycles and the trends repeat themselves and certain filmmakers might not get talked about for a little bit and then suddenly everybody's talking about them and then people forget about them for five, 10, 15 years, and then they're talking about them again. And um, it's this thing of having to kind of keep rewriting the history. And I, I guess, you know, um, I, I guess the same is probably true for both of you. But for me, my sort of main job is that I write for a national newspaper, which has an extremely broad readership, whose interests are probably much broader than my own, quite specific, very personal, very niche, sometimes perhaps a bit weird um kind of uh, curiosities you know the things that i'm interested in and so i think um what i'm always trying to do is, is bridge that and so keep bringing people in um as i go along and and keep trying to expand my own reference points and then bring people into those as well um i certainly didn't kind of wake up knowing 
stuff like you you read um you're introduced to things by your colleagues by your friends by people you admire um and so i i think that's how i try to engage with with the history by kind of trying to open it out rather than expecting people to just kind of come with a, a pre-existing knowledge and actually that's something that i think is a real problem in film criticism we'll probably talk about it more later mm -hmm. where on one hand there needs to be a certain level of comprehension and like an understanding of film history and expertise people want to go to you because you understand things more than they do perhaps but i also think that it can be really off-putting and really limiting if that set of reference points feels fixed oh, yeah. and so um that's something that I'm always trying to kind of like think about and engage with as well. Like how much do you really need to know to interpret and understand something or for it to resonate emotionally? Yeah. How much reading and prior watching is actually necessary? I so don't I'm, really believe in homework, you know? I'm reading this book, The Once Upon a Time in Hollywood novelization at the moment. It's it's not good, but um, I, I really enjoyed the film. So I'm like, I'm, I'm you know, I'm still reading it, but um he keeps just listing reference points that he has. Mm -hmm. And and it's just that kind of, that particularly male kind of, stereotypically male at least, not all men, hashtag not all men, um, thing of, you know, there almost being an entry exam for you to, mm -hmm. before you're allowed to like film, before you're allowed to be into film, you've got to know all of these references. And, and it's just kind of exhausting. I, I, I guess in terms of your question, what I've tried to do is, is sort of just build it in to the day-to-day -day a little bit you know so try and even if you're talking about a marvel movie or a Fanta fast and furious movie or something you know there are still discussions to be had about the way women are portrayed in these movies or the way that women were involved behind the scenes or not in as is usually the case and it's worth just kind of mentioning that and banging the drum and so that people know why it matters when something comes along that's a bit different and, and something comes along that maybe does something new. And I'm not saying that, you know, blockbusters are at the forefront of change because they're absolutely not, but they still signal some kind of progression. And I think it still is worth talking about, even in that kind of arena, um, because people do, you know, we're not particularly aware of five or 10 years ago of fridging. And I put it in the book and I kind of didn't necessarily explain what it was at first, but the concept of fridging, which is, when it's, it's a comic book term, I don't know how many of you know it, but basically it's the hero's girlfriend or wife or whoever gets killed or gets maimed and then stays killed or maimed because it's just a way to get the hero to feel. Whereas if the hero's best buddy, the male buddy is killed or maimed, he tends to be resurrected and be more powerful than ever. So there's this really imbalance and people are now beginning to, to talk about this and they're beginning to see it when it happens and they're beginning to take note and that will begin to change that trope and so, you know, it, it does progress slowly towards something that's maybe a little bit more equal or something. I don't know, at least I hope so. Yeah, we all hope so, definitely. <laughs> um, I think, so we touched on a few really, I mean, so many meaty things already that I just wanna jump on. Um, but one thing that I think is already coming out quite strongly is the idea that the fixed points that we've been using to navigate cinema, the canon, if you wanna call it that, has been restricted and limiting and has maybe excluded people, or definitely has excluded people from both a, um, in terms of who was able to make stuff and then who got it seen, but also from a fan point of view and a watcher point of view, it's off-putting if when you look at the list of top 100 films on IMDb or whatever, it's all male-dominated, male-directed um, stories. Um, so I think that maybe is a good jumping off point into the huge topic of our tier theory and whether we want it or not, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> and how useful it is. Um, so Helen, in your book, you make a really, um, I think you describe sausage theory, uh, auto theory as a sausage fest. Yeah. <laughs> at one point. Um, I wonder if you could just introduce the idea of auto theory and maybe explain what you mean by that. Yeah, so look, it, it, it did and does have some kind of uh, use, basically. So it, basically the, the argument was, if, if cinema is an art form, who's the artist? And essentially the answer that the, the French, the, the, the Cahiers de Cinema crowd came up with is it's the director. It's the director who's the author. He makes the sort of decisions of what exactly gets shot on set. And then he puts it all together in the editing room and it is a he in, in all of the examples that they originally listed. 
um, and and therefore the you know not every film has an author, not every film is art, but those that are tend to be where there is this powerful director figure who can make this all come together. Um, and, and it was useful in the sense that it helped enormously with film preservation and with film being taken seriously. And, you know, at a time when the studios didn't see much benefit in keeping their old work, the auteur theory made the case for restoration, made the case for protection. And, and that's been enormously important. That's been really, really, really helpful. Um, what's bad about it is the more that you lionize directors, the less likely it is that women are gonna get the chance to direct. Um, and the less credit everyone else on set gets for the work that they do. Uh, and those are the jobs where women have historically been more able to thrive. So editors and, you know, um, later on, you know, production designers and things like that, those were kind of diminished by this incredible focus on the director, which was a, a job that was still sort of held out of women's reach. So yeah, that, that's basically the issue with it. If we're going to have an auteur theory, it's reductive and, and kind of silly given how many people are involved in making a film. But OK, if, if that's what you need to to take film seriously, fine. But then we have to look at who we allow to be an auteur. And if we're not allowing everyone to be an auteur, then we've got some real problems. And I think that's a really um, interesting story that comes out of the start of cinema, Pamela, right? Because the author theory comes in later as yeah. an idea the director is the, the main person. Yeah, so it's sort of in the sort of mid twenties, that's when Dorothy Osner walked onto a set and went, oh yeah, the director's in charge. That's the job I want. And, you know, we thank her for that. But, you know, there was this sort of in the early film period, everyone just mucked in and roles were roles and people duplicated roles. And of course, when we think about silent era, we think of women, we think of these amazing screenwriters who had a lot of power, who became like, June Mathis was one of the highest paid executives in Hollywood. And there's this description of what the screenwriter does that Frances Marion wrote, um, that she was quoted in a magazine. And it, I find it fantastic because it, it really is quite powerful. And she still assumes the director is a man, even though she directed two and a half, um, two films. So she says, being a screenwriter involves stories working scenarios ready for the director to proceed, tarrying with him through every scene as it is filmed, editing and cutting the complete product and title writing every bit of it. So I think maybe if we were gonna think about the auteur theory, Frances Marion and her cohort would, would, would step neatly into that role. I think going further on, you then have directors, young directors who are taken with the auteur theory and are trying to be auteurs in their sort of second film and it's sort of quite strange and cute in a way but it's not helpful necessarily when you you feel like we get to know names and those names are reducing the idea of who's working on their films rather than bringing everyone up together which is would be an ideal and sort of rather utopian film industry. And you definitely see that I mean there's um, obviously there's the 1971 season happening as part of Cinema Rediscovered and that's an interesting moment because it's a moment when the auteur theory kind of sweeps Hollywood in a way because you have all these young guys who want to be auteurs and have read the translations, um, which were translated by Polly Platt in some cases, which is quite an interesting little sidebar. Um, so you get this um, kind of lionization of auteur theory and the um, idea of the director is the maverick genius really becoming um, part of Hollywood at that time in a really obvious way, um, which then neglects to mention all the amazing work done by People like Polly Platt, wife of Peter Bogdanovich, but also amazing uh, designer, producer, essential genius. Um, Toby Rafelson, also an art designer, and um, worked with Bob Rafelson. All kinds of stories um, that really got buried by that reductive label, um, that very macho label. There. Yeah. Um, Simran, do you think about auto theory and um, when you write your weekly reviews, how much do you think about the director as the author of the works that you are? critiquing? Strange because of the way we kind of um, metabolize auteur theory, you, it's almost second nature that you might refer to a film as, um, you know, director's name, title of the film. It, it's sort of baked into to how we're expected to write almost as a style guide. Um, and I, I think that it is not always the most interesting or most productive way to talk about a film. You know, Pam was talking about screenwriters, I think you could argue that a lot of actors and actresses are auteurs of, 
of their yeah. kind of projects. And yeah. if, you look, if you're thinking about auteur theory as the sum of a body of work, look at, I don't know, someone like Marilyn Monroe, like her kind of ineffable presence, um, the consistency of what she brings to lots of very different projects, um, the legacy, you know, all of these things you could attribute to to a filmmaker, to a director, but also, you know, the the star can also make the film as well. Um, so I, I, I try to uh, dispense with auteur theory. Uh, I'm not super interested in it, um, but of course, uh, you know, I, I, it's hard to escape, um, especially when you have a kind of fairly restrictive style guide um, and kind of limited space. Sometimes I get, I guess like the, the, I guess another way to think about it is that we talk about the director as a sort of shorthand. Yeah. So, you know, Adam was talking about Tarantino, Quentin Tarantino earlier, but like Tarantino-esque as an adjective uh, is shorthand for all sorts of things, right? You know, um, comic book style violence, very bloody. Um, very talky. Very, so yeah, very the kind of intellectual. But exactly, we're, we're throwing out word, words here, but maybe the, more, the challenge for the writer is to find a, a more descriptive, more accurate, uh, clearer way of describing something than kind of falling back on a, a Altera shorthand. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because one, one alternative of authorship in that sense um, that automatically brings women into the conversation, like you said, you, Mary, uh, Marilyn, for example, is, is if you look at stardom and um, I'm going to quote you here again, Pam, and because you said that you love um, an approach, for example, calling it Jane Fonda's clute instead yes. of, you know, yeah. so like, um, which it is. It, it, Jeff, it Jeff. is, it is, absolutely. Exactly. I think exactly. don't, just don't put a man's name in front of a film unless you really have to. It's what I always think, you know, it isn't always the way. And it's sometimes hard to take people with you there because I think I wrote an article recently that was quite long, just pretty much entirely to call it Cali Curry's Thelma and Louise. And when you think <laughs> about it now, with everything that's happened since, you think it's kind of retrospectively Gina Davis's Thelma and Louise. I mean, wonderful to draw out all these threads, but I mean, and no shade to Ridley Scott ever. You know, you don't have to, I shouldn't have to say this, but you, you're not trying to say that the director has no input. You're trying to say, you know, I show students D.W. Griffith films because I show them the actors and the screenwriters that were involved, you know, um, and so I shouldn't have called them D.W. Griffiths films, but you see what I'm saying. We're, yeah. we're trapped in this tr little uh, trick, aren't we, Simran? <laughs> I know, it's hard and to this, break. Yeah, and, and they don't cancel each other out, do they? Mm. I mean, just because we call it Tarantino's whatever, it doesn't mean that we, um, we're cancelling it you know the other options of how to call it out it's yeah. and, and that's the same with with Jane Clute you're not uh, Jane Fonda's Clute you're not erasing another name you know just by doing that you're just elevating something that's been you know hidden yeah yeah um but um kind of shifting back to you Simran so you've we, we listened to your, to the 2020 podcast and you dove really into, into um, the naughty. So not looking at, at Jane Fonda maybe, but do you have any kind of contemporary examples that, that you could um, that you could share with us that, that kind of show this, the similar or similar kind of? Well, well, I mean, I guess it's not from, um, it's not from exactly 20 years ago, I think, although I think it's almost its 20th anniversary next year. But um, one film that I think about often, and I know Pam thinks about it too, is Crossroads. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, yeah, quite. And, and, um, <laughs> I, I can't believe that we've gone this highbrow this quickly. <laughs> oh, you know me. I like to keep it highbrow. Um, and so in this film, for anybody who's not familiar, um, if you're around my age, you probably watched it when you were a preteen and obsessed with Britney Spears. It is a Britney Spears star vehicle uh, written by Shonda Rhimes, uh, directed by Tamara Davis and uh, starring Britney Spears, Zoe Saldana and... Um, ooh, oh, what's the first one? from... Um, yeah. <laughs> Black. What's her name? Taryn Mann. <laughs> Um, yeah, Taryn. Yeah. I'm famously very bad with remembering the names of actors, which is obviously not ideal for my job. But um, 
this this movie uh, was, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it a, a flop in terms of box office success. I think like you know, Britney made people kind of turn up and watch it, but it was critically panned um, at the time and kind of thought of as as not an interesting or worthy film. Um, but of course, Shonda Rhimes uh, has gone on to be a TV and film producing, show running, writing legend. And this is one of her kind of earlier projects before Grey's Anatomy, before Scandal. Um, and can you make the argument that it's she's an auteur in that sense or, or that um, that's part of her kind of auteur's journey? Uh, I think, you know, we don't we don't like to um, kind of celebrate films that are for women, especially for young women. And um, I, that I think was part of the project of, of 2020, not exclusively focusing on, on kind of films for young women, but just thinking about the stuff that Tara, my co-host Tara Joshi, she's a brilliant music writer, and I had consumed when we were very young and hadn't thought about critically. Mm. Um, and now as adults with, uh, you know, like more kind of critical understanding, trying to think, well, were those just, you know, for kids or for teenagers or whatever, like, you know? This well, is yeah. Th sorry this is something I feel so strongly about as well I mean it just does my head in there Cross are so many Helen. <laughs> not cross well okay Crossroads <laughs> is not one of my personal like top five but um but like it is that whole genre of just films for teenage girls that is written off and dismissed mm -hmm. over and over and over again and assumed to be fluff no matter how non-fluffy it is I mean no. I'm not saying Dirty Dancing is high art but Dirty Dancing has some quite serious themes and some quite serious ideas as well as you know Patrick Swayze with his top off and it gets completely dismissed because 12 year old girls love it um uh, you know Legally Blonde is genuinely an important film mm -hmm. for entire generations of women and it gets written off because she wears pink it, it's just this assumption that well, because partly because lots of critics have been, you know, middle-aged white men, partly because um, those are the people who sort of decide who the canon is, uh, it's been written off, but also partly because they just don't respect young girls. They just don't care about their interests. They don't consider them serious and worthy of attention. I mean, I think if you look at the compare, if you compare and contrast the reviews of, let's say, Transformers and Twilight, which came out around the same time, I would suggest that they are about as clever as each other. I would say that actually um, Twilight is probably slightly cleverer um, on a lower budget. And, you know, one was written about as this ridiculous nonsensical farce and the other one was written about as a, you know, serious attempt to bring big robots to the big screen. Like they're, yeah. they're the same in terms of quality, really. But, yeah. the, but the, the film reviews are kind of reviewing the audience. Yeah. I just, I just want to set the record straight if we're rewriting history with the women in it, that not all critics panned Crossroads and Legally on, on release. I gave them both good reviews and I had a very tough day in the office after both <laughs> reviews were filed and it was entirely not gratifying to find the response to my piece on Crossroads recently eliciting a similar response 20 years later oh, uh, from some people who kept saying, oh, I wish you'd have written about the... Uh, the Robert Johnson film of the same name. And you just think, well, no, I could have done. I could have done. Almost I felt like they were angry that I'd chosen to write about Britney Spears. And you think, I mean, she's one of the most important talking points of the year. So yeah, she, she was. She still is. Uh, exactly, well. she was in 2001, yeah. she is now. She's still really important as a cultural figure. And yeah, I think Sorry. it's so it just shows. I think I think that history's proven you right, Pat, <laughs> on that one, that it was it important to write about. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think what that reveals um tellingly is how much the who is the critic can shape the discourse. Um, who is the critic, who is the historian is all part of shaping that narrative. And something that I found quite heartening is I think that now if you start sagging off legally blonde a lot, you would maybe get some resistance because it's objectively great but also because there is now a space the internet and um, social media where people are able to be very passionately vocal about their fandom um, yeah, and that has allowed to to an extent with limitations um groups of people including teenage girls one of those groups to more vocally defend and support the work that they love mm. um simran as a critic that i know came up through the internet and writing online and 
as someone who's engaged with the internet, I know everyone's always engaged with the internet. It's not like an old, old woman. <laughs> but I know that you're someone who writes a bit about internet culture and pop culture and fandom. Um, and I wonder how you feel um, kind of new media is shaping that conversation. If it is getting significantly better, if these attitudes towards um, work that may be aimed at teenage girls is, are changing, how do you feel about that? I think it's getting better and worse at the same time. Um, it, it, I know that's a sort of cop-out uh, no, answer, right. but, but I, I think it's getting better in the sense that um, there's less space for bullshit to go like unchecked. So that's good. You know, we can hold people to account. We can point out when things are sexist or racist. I, I think that's really important and there's a space for that. But I also think that sometimes that level of scrutiny can make people incredibly timid in their criticism. I think that um, there is a whole generation of people, um, probably my, my age and, and younger, I'm kind of mainly talking about, who are kind of coming up and are totally aware that they could get cancelled. Uh, I use the word cancelled, you know, quotation marks, but that there could be repercussions for them professionally, socially, perhaps even financially, um, if they kind of say the wrong thing. And the right thing to say is constantly changing. It's always shifting. Um, and so that is really difficult. And I, I think, you know, um, I don't really, I, it's hard to kind of like articulate it without making myself sound incredibly insecure. Um, yeah, but it's true. But, it's 100% true. Yeah. But I, I, I think, you know, as somebody who um, is not white, uh, is a woman, is not especially established, I sometimes feel a little bit self-conscious when publishing um, a review of something where there's been an embargo and I don't know how everybody else has responded and there's a part of me that thinks oh uh, have I gotten it right um, and actually you know like just like everybody else I've watched the film I've paid attention to it I have a pre-existing knowledge that would give me context and uh, I you know have the ability to to read a film and interpret it so really it's not re a question of right or wrong but I do think that um, there's a, a consensus culture that is becoming, I guess it's always been there, but I, I feel it's becoming more and more um, pervasive. And what the internet has done to that is kind of sped up the cycle a little bit more. Mm. So there's a kind of um, reaction and then often there's a backlash and then there's a backlash to the backlash and then it all <laughs> dies down and then it starts again. And, and the life cycles of um, these kind of, disputes or disagreements they they're very short but they're very intense and I, I don't always think that that um makes it the internet I mean and, and specifically Twitter uh, a great place to discuss movies it's it's I was thinking about this today because there was um I don't know if people saw but Amanda Knox the the student yeah. who had all the legal problems in Italy was writing about Stillwater and saying that you know this this has clearly taken inspiration and I've seen it in Cannes so I can say this it definitely took inspiration from her case and the filmmakers have acknowledged that but they never reached out to her in advance they never talked to her about it and and that that Twitter thread I think is going to be influential and I think it's going to be discussed in Stillwater reviews and this issue of where they justified in in drawing from her story and fictionalizing a similar incident um that's now going to be part of the Stillwater conversation and I think people who don't address that are going to be scolded by people who have read this thread and they're going to be questioned about it and and that's an interesting question because I they've absolutely taken inspiration from her life and it is absolutely the worst thing that's ever happened to her and, and, and incredibly difficult for her to deal with um on the other hand, generally inspired by has been a very, very loose definition and has not historically necessarily led people to reach out to the person that inspired them. So what is your, sorry, I'm just hitting the mic, but what is your um, obligation as a filmmaker? What is your obligation to reach out? You know, what is your obligation then as a reviewer discussing this film? These are all kind of rules that are slightly up in the air and slightly being reset as Simran says day to day and you're like what if I, I think I'm doing the right thing today will that be the right thing by the standards of tomorrow and you really don't know so you I mean look you have to do your best and try not to be a dick about it I guess but but it is something that does probably take up more of our headspace than it would have done if we'd been in this business 20 years ago and certainly 30 or 40. 
Yeah, I think, um, Helen, you just proved that your legal training was actually very good training for your film criticism. <laughs> I, I think that it's really interesting when you talk about like Amanda Knox's real life and what you were talking about, Simran, about, sorry, bullshit. You know, <laughs> we can take some of this modern rigor to some of the old stories that we've read. And I know that we have done that in these very serious ways where we've you know, we've looked at Me Too and then we've looked at, you know, Judy Garland or these historic cases. But I do this all the time because there are all these anecdotes from film history that get repeated in books and books again and again, retold. And sometimes you have to look at them and you have to sort of drink a cup of coffee and go, what the hell? So I'm trying to do this quickly, but I don't know if you all know a really fun screwball film called 20th Century. The second half of the film is basically a, a fight on a train. It's like slapstick, snow piercer really good film and it's <laughs> Carol, Lo Carol Lombard and jo John Barrymore and Howard Hawks directed it and apparently one day he took Carol Lombard aside he wasn't pleased with her performance and he said well what would you do in real life if a man said that to you and she said well I'd kick him in the balls which is a very Carol Lombard thing to say so then he set her out back on set and she just acted like she naturally would this gets repeated again and again and again and it, and it absolutely boils my blood because Carol Lombard used to work for Max Sennett in like the greatest slapstick studio ever she knew how to stunt fight she knew how to control her body and we tell these stories again and again that infantilize the female creatives that say oh it's just her natural way or this man took this star and made her what she could be but not by training her not by empowering her in any way not by suggesting that she had anything to teach other people but by just saying that you know she didn't understand the film until he unleashed her natural qualities and um, it might be true you know it might be exactly true but you always have to look at this um, and bring that kind of modern rigor to some of these mm. seemingly harmless stories. I should calm down about it, really. <laughs> I think that's totally fair. But I think there's a lot of that going around. I think you get a lot of, especially uh, directors, taking credit for bringing something out of their actresses. And you're like, but th they did it. You know, so it's not your work, it's their work. I mean, it, uh, even I was writing a review of a, uh, an Aretha Franklin related project that is under embargo but anyway you can probably figure out which one um and you know the, i think her life story is one of men taking credit f as her producer as her mentor as her husband and manager or whatever and it's like she's a freaking aretha franklin guys come on you know what more do you need um and i think she gets credited as a singer and not as a general artistic genius uh, in the same way that her male contemporaries maybe did you know i think We're there's a genius. lot of that going on yeah. You know, the word genius is gender neutral. We do forget that quite a lot. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, throwing in Marilyn here as well is really interesting because she's someone who gets infantilized and very much infantilized partly because of her screen persona, which was a persona that she was also sort of um, pushed into in some of her films, um, but also one that she created that is a genius creation as well. But because of that, there seems to be an inability to tell the difference between her as a performer and her as a person. And those lines have become so blurred. And Helen, you have a little bit in your book about that and it's um I mean it's stuff that you kind of know already but it just needs to be said over and over again how smart and canny um and brilliant Marilyn was in lots of ways as well as as damaged because of the society she lived in but yeah it's a it's really has to be constantly reset I think yeah. oh she's just one of the greatest mm. she's one of the all-time greatest I love her yeah um so yeah everyone who is watching is able to ask questions and we have had a question come in um, which I'll just throw out now, which is actually a really good question. But if you do have any questions and you're watching, please throw them in now. We've got about 15 minutes left, so there's definitely time to dig into some of those. Um, so this is a question to Pamela, um, and this is from Circa. Um, the fact, isn't the fact that many historic films have been lost somehow blurring what's considered to be part of the canon and film history? We can only analyze what's left. That goes not only for early film history, but also for light entertainment that, has since, that have since been seen as ephemeral or not worth preserving, like the example of films for teenage girls. Um, I think that's a really interesting question. Pamela, do you want to pick, pick up on that? Well, yeah, I mean, so anyone who is engaged with the history of black cinema and thinking about race films has feels this so deeply because those films were not treated or kept or even widely distributed. Lots of films are uh, lost and, and found for very accidental reasons. There are some rather maddening stories of women from the silent era who deposited their films for posterity and the people that they deposited them with did not take care of them. 
around about the coming of sound, people started thinking the idea of a female director was quite odd. And so they almost acted like they'd never happened. So they were still um, preserving films made by the great men that they knew. And I know that Helen likes this story. Um, well, I say like, I think it sort of enraged you so it's much. Enjoyable, it, but but yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a wonderful Lois Weber film, which I'm incredibly passionate about, called Shoes. And that film um, survives in the oddest ways. Lots of films only survive because they were put onto like a home video, like 9.5. Shoes, a lot of the material for the restoration came from a version that had been made to mock the film by adding a comical voiceover narration to the story of a woman's tragedy. And it's really quite frustrating to, to watch it. I don't recommend you do, but it's almost like that's the perverse way in which we've sort of captured one of the great performances of the silent era. And I, you know, I'm not going to pretend to be grateful for it. But yeah, we do, we do think that the films that survive are important. We do think that the films that we've all been watching are important, you know, and there are lots of films that even just because of rights reasons you can't see, and they would completely fundamentally change our idea of what are the greats from certain eras. I definitely can only really speak so much on the, the early and silent period on this, but I'm sure it continues right through, especially independent cinema in the 1970s, I think is a, it's a real problem. And I think just to add to that, really, like, I guess in this context, we're talking about the literal prints and the files of the films that survive. But I also think that, you know, as writers, we're archivists in a way. And so in what we choose to write about, what we deem important or worthwhile um, in documenting and kind of marking out as significant, I think that's really important as well. And I definitely see that as a big part of my my job to kind of draw attention to stuff that I don't want to be forgotten about as it's happening. Yeah. yeah. And that's really it, right? With the with with the physical copies of things. So Rachel and I, the work that we do, we we used to go into physical archives to try and find physical copies of films. And um, you know, at the at the at the Gla Glasgow Moving Image Archive, we went to a room that, which was called the Dirty Film Vault, where you could actually um, see how some some of the film that were not not by the Moving Image Archive, they their preservation work is amazing but older films that hadn't been preserved and then you can literally see like the physical decay and also sadly I don't know if you've seen the news in, in Sao Paulo the Cinemateca which is burning right now which oh, is just it's you know it's no words really because the things that will be in those vaults right now are the ones that haven't been deemed important enough mm -hmm. to maybe be in the Filmoteca or somewhere have been um I really hope that that um important work like the obviously that most of it has been taken out but it's it's really soul destroying seeing mm -hmm. this and in that case the the internet is great because you're writing that's something i wanted to pick up on earlier as well that another thing about the internet right now is that everything is immortal you know everything that you write right now um in that whatever it's it's on the internet it's there for posterity isn't hopefully. it hopefully <laughs> <Right. laughs> yeah. although if yeah. you know if you're a writer and watching this is worth saving your stuff it just is. in case yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. the entire empire website was replaced about five years ago so the, the reviews were kept but a lot of the features that we'd written over the past 10 years 20 years before that had been were removed i'm, I'm probably quite grateful that those reviews of crossroads and legally blonde that i wrote when i was quite young are not um unless anyone has a particular archive of that magazine <laughs> <laughs> but yeah um but yeah do we have any more questions that maybe we can just while we're waiting to see if anything comes in from the audience um to just go back to the idea of authorship and what alternative authorship might be about there's a really great one of um the episodes of 2020 i really enjoyed simran was when he spoke to the music supervisor on Kurt ugly and oh. i thought that was such a good argument for the music supervisor as author of a film can you talk a little bit about that yeah, so um, I see my face light up thinking about yeah. it. Really <laughs> so uh, that film was supervised by an incredible woman called Kathy Nelson. And really, Tara and I were trying to think, how can we, and our producers as well, um, Em and Jacob, we were thinking, how can we talk about like quite a broad swathe of films um, and kind of, and I, think the, I think the way we, we like developed the idea is, I wanted to do something about like the movie tie-in single because I felt like 
I grew up with all these music videos and all of these songs that were kind of specifically for movies, but um, that nobody had really kind of like written anything um, that I could kind of easily access about why that trend was sort of happening in the early noughties and, and I guess like before in the nineties as well. Um, and, and why we don't really have that or why it, even if we have it, those songs like, for example, um, Miley Cyrus, Lana Del Rey, and um, I think it was Ariana Grande, like they did a song for the new Charlie's Angels. You know, like if that was happened 20 years ago, that would have been a whole different story. And, and so Kathy Nelson, um, she was a music supervisor, pioneering women in the field actually. And um, Coyote Ugly was one of her kind of big projects that she did. She, although she also, um, she also famously was involved um, with the song Gangster's Paradise uh, as well, um, which was written written for the, the movie. And so with um, with Can't Fight the Moonlight, they they kind of got Leanne Rhymes at the last minute and um, it, w it wasn't originally meant to be her and it was all to do with who was working for the label at the time and who was available and they had to like make her, um, that they were going to have Piper Parabo, who's the lead singer, uh, lead singer, she's the, she's the lead character, but she sort of has a singing role in the film. Uh, and her singing was so bad that they had to kind of like make her go and, and, and be dubbed. And I, I just think really kind of talking to people like Kathy is, is really interesting because those behind the scenes, below the line kind of roles aren't discussed. Um, and, and music supervision is, is absolutely one of the, the really interesting um, aspects of filmmaking that doesn't really get talked about those. And she also works as a music supervisor in High Fidelity, which is remembered for its soundtrack. Mm. Um, and actually the TV remake, uh, R.I.P., wish that was getting renewed, um, that took a lot of care in its, its soundtrack as well. And um, yeah, she's not, not a household name. I think she was pretty surprised when I tracked her down and called her up and then spoke to her on the phone for an hour, begging her to come on our podcast. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I think she's she's a really interesting example. And, you know, we talked about Polly Platt a little bit earlier. Um, Karina Longworth's season on her is really interesting and, and, and worth checking out. Um, there are loads of loads of women who don't direct and yet have like a such an influence on, on films. Mm. Um, Almost yeah. every casting director ever, a yeah. woman, mm. and also, we completely undervalue that role just because I think people don't understand what it means because we mm -hmm. play it as a game and also because we tell a lot of these great Hollywood anecdotes about how someone discovers someone or how and you know even if you even if that's true to the lead role it, casting is the entire film and it's a completely misunderstood and underappreciated art by myself entirely I'm sure um it's thought of as yeah. it's, casting is thought of as a feminine art mm. and like you know that's that's described in such a derogatory way um it's madness but even like editing but like people realize that editors are important but if you look at like even the great author directors if we're using the word you know uh tarantino again steven spielberg Lots david lane yeah, yeah cecil b demille they all had go-to female editors certainly for the start of their careers or most of their careers um and and you know they get talked about as the big auteur mm -hmm. what huh and some didn't even have editors they just had splice girls mm. they just had people that they were like well this is where the cut should be you, you can do it neatly and you think what the actual precision of that cut brought to the table uh yeah splice girl not one of my favorite uh, terms the editing one is a really is a really interesting one i um, to my shame, I only recently found out about Marsha Lucas and the work that she did with George Lucas and how involved she was with his early films and how they suspiciously went a bit off when they got divorced. You can't help wondering if there's a little sure. bit of an overlap. That was <laughs> strange. Flat and Peter Bogdanovich as well, quite a similar thing happened, I noticed. So. What a coincidence. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, and but the thing is, like, obviously, we're preaching to the choir here, right? Like, we'd all love to read books um, just about about these women or, or see biopics. Um, Helen, you mentioned in an interview that we that that Rachel and I both listened to where you talk about how Mimi Leader tried to make a film about Frances Marion and just couldn't find any to it. get it off the ground. And uh, when we spoke to Karina Longworth as well, she told us very candidly about how she went to public like to a publisher, she went to TV stations, she tried to get the Polly Platt series made 
as a series or as a book and there's just no interest. Um, heartingly, we have the, the, the Alice Guy Be Natural documentary now. Do you guys, like all three of you, do you see that maybe have we re reached potentially like a turning point? Are people, is there gonna, is there growing awareness? Um, I mean, obviously we also are much more exposed to something like, like a film or a release like Be Natural because that's kind of the, the, the space that we operate in semi anyway. Um, but I don't know, I'd just love to hear your thoughts looking, looking to the future, maybe. Well, I hope, uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Just can, I was only gonna say that you can make a film about women in film just as long as it's 14 hours long. <laughs> and your Mark Cousins. <laughs> and in good payment, he had great researchers and there's got to work in there, but the thought of many people we know working in this field being able to make a 14 hour film. I mean, I say that as someone who watched it. So, you know, I can tell you it's, it's a great watch <laughs> if you have two days. <laughs> I, I do think I do think things are getting a little better. I don't think they are equal or even close to it. And I don't think that they're yeah, I don't think they're by any means there yet. I think if if Mimi Letter went back out with the Francis Marion project today, I still don't think she'd get it made. Mm. I, I still don't think that would happen. So I think there's still a long way to go. Um, and yeah, I don't know how long it's going to take to change, because if you look at this, the stats on female directors, we've known the stats were bad for at least 20 years and they have not shifted as a result of that. And I think what is maybe helping now is we are getting some high profile breakthroughs. So even though their numbers are still small, they're getting way more column inches than they used to. They're getting way more attention than they used to. And I hope that that will fuel, you know, those filmmakers second or third or fourth or whatever films. Um, and I hope that it will m help financiers, you know, give the next Rose Glass or the next um, Prano Bailey Bond a chance. But it's still starting from an incredibly low point. So I think there's still a really, really, really long way to go. I just hope that by having these conversations, we actually start making people even aware that there's a problem to be addressed, because I don't think Hollywood wanted to face that for a very long time. Yeah. And yeah, I agree. Uh, and, um, no, what I wanted to say is, well, even though I, I just said like uh, preaching to the choir also that we have so many people listening to this to this event today as well. So there is definitely these conversations are, are not just being had in a in a room of five people who are passionate about this. Anyway, there's lots of people who are interested in listening and, and hopefully um, going to be talking about this as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we are just going to the end of our time. Um, so we probably do need to wrap up just quickly. If you don't mind hanging on for five minutes, Max. And sure. um, we've got one more audience question that I think I should throw in um, because it's a very considered one. Um, so this is from Mark David asking um, whether we think it would be useful to discard the distinction between highbrow and lowbrow cinema. Um, or is it worth retaining that distinction or a similar one given that so much lowbrow cin cinema has at various times been a place for films by and about women, people of color, et cetera, where they've been allowed to thrive. Um, and I think that is an interesting question that kind of hints at what happens when this becomes mainstream. Does it all become flattened out and less interesting? Mm. Is part of that. Um, who wants to maybe jump at that, any ideas? Well, I, I have a suggestion um, and it's not to kind of um, do away with the terms of, of lowbrow and highbrow, but maybe to kind of consider our approach to both of those films. I think sometimes it's really satisfying to talk about or to write about a lowbrow film with absolute seriousness and respect and reverence and to take it absolutely seriously. Similarly, I think sometimes films that we assume are important and meaty and worthy because of who made them or who's attached to them. I don't think that we have to always take those films super seriously and talk about them in terms of Oscars. I think you can find the kind of campness and the strangeness and the comedy in films that take themselves incredibly seriously and in, in the kind of yeah, films that we might otherwise overlook and dismiss, maybe there's something worthwhile in them if we kind of approach them with a seriousness. Um, and so, yeah, I think just having a, a flexible approach and, and not kind of making 
judgments and decisions about what we think something is before we've properly engaged with it I think that that might be a possible solution I 100% agree I I have sometimes come out of uh, quote-unquote highbrow films and thought yes I know exactly what that was about and then I'll go into uh oh god what was that terrible Hugh Jackman rom-com animal attraction someone like you it's got one of those names in this country anyway but that genuinely made me think about relationships in a really weird way and I got quite like deep into that and the Fast and Furious movies I maintain there is a fascinating dissertation to be written about the portrayal of masculinity in those movies there is a genuinely fascinating take what the hell is modern masculinity if men are watching this like I think there's I would I really want to read it I need someone smarter than me to write it Pam if you're free Simran if you're free please but um but there is a fascinating story to be had there even though they are so dumb they're out the other side into clever you know they're just they're amazing <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I, I think it's a, it's a matter of mixing it up and just being inspired by what you're inspired by. Good points both. I, I say embrace the middle brow, which is where you <laughs> often find a lot of films adapted from very popular novels by women, you know, and, you know, it's a hard thing to define, but I know a lot of people who work specifically on the middle brow and it's popular entertainment with a little bit of empathy quite frankly it always seems to come down to and I think we might find that a lot of the films we're talking about are really there somewhere in the middle um yeah it's very, very fast and furious very middle brown yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah of course I just totally both sides the whole thing <laughs> I'm both fast and furious <laughs> I've always said that about you <laughs> Um, so just to, as a final last point, just to wrap everything up, it's been a, such a great conversation. I could literally go on for far more hours, but we will not <laughs> because people have things to do. Um, but just to give everyone who's watching a little bit of homework if they want it, I was wondering if each of you would mind just giving maybe the name of one um, woman from the history of cinema who you feel like they should go away and Google with a little quick kind of teaser about why this is an interesting person um, for them to kind of have a look at someone they might not have heard of. Um, anyone want to go first with that? Or is that a little bit too much on the spot? No, I'll, I'll, go, I'll, go, I'll go first. <laughs> I, I, I did think about this uh, and I thought I was going to go for someone incredibly obscure and make you all think I was clever. <laughs> but I'm really glad that um, Simran mentioned Marilyn Monroe because I want to mention one of the most famous women of all time, Mary Pickford, who did not ever direct a film and she made it incredibly clear the only reason she didn't direct a film is that she was doing absolutely everything else. So look at her body of work and go and call Mimi Lader and see if we can get that Francis Marion film made. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Oh my God, can you imagine? Um, very good, very good pick. <laughs> I, I want to shout out um, a woman who is a really important part of a trio of filmmakers that only get described as a duo. Um, her name is Ruth Pryor Javala. <laughs> And she is the third invisible member of Merchant and Ivory. Um, one of my kind of lockdown projects is that I've been watching a lot of Merchant and Ivory films. Nice. Um, if you love period dramas, specifically from the 80s and the 90s, that are incredibly emotional, deal with social class, are quite long, beautifully, impeccably costumed, these are your movies. And um, she is a screenwriter. Um, to Merchant's producer and um, Ivory's director. And so I don't understand why her name is like not in Merchant Ivory. Uh, maybe just because it doesn't fit as well or it doesn't roll off the tongue as nicely. But she's, you know, worked with them from the early 1960s as a crucial part of that filmography and that film history um, with a novelist uh, as well as a screenwriter. And it is really... I think an important person in history who we don't talk about that much. Um, so yeah, give, give her a go, give her a Google. <laughs> I was gonna say maybe Nell Shipman, another silent era person who um, started off as kind of uh, actress and then branched out into screenwriting and producing and eventually directing and was known for just going into the wilderness with a bunch of animals and some cameras and coming back with a movie essentially and it just it's it's kind of movie making as an extreme sport of which there was quite a lot in the silent era because there was nothing in the way of health and safety um if you can't get hold of any Nell Shipman films I also recommend you know some of the action serials starring women at the same time the hazards of Helen is obviously my favorite but there's also the exploits of Elaine and the perils of Pauline so uh, you've got lots of options 
but you know it's literally just these women who are jumping onto trains and jumping off trains onto cars and um at one point i think there was a climbing down a, uh, a rope ladder from a balloon that i mentioned uh, that i remember things like that and yeah just doing whatever just doing these crazy stunts for for no reason except the love of cinema um and I, I hope some money as well but like it, they're just they're brilliant they're hilarious and um i think they are a great counterpoint to anyone who says that women don't like action movies and there's some great pictures of nell with bears all over yes the yes she had a pet bear cool. of her very own <laughs> yeah. yeah um well i think that wraps it all up pretty well um this was fascinating um thank you so much for the three of you to to joining us. Thanks for Cinema Rediscovered for inviting us um, and letting us and giving us the space to have this conversation. Um, yeah, we we love chatting to all of you. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for everyone who um, came and uh, joined the conversation. Thank you for your questions. And yeah, we'll um, see you all on the internet. We'll be watching what you're doing and engaging and yeah, have a lovely weekend, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much.